Hey everyone, how's it going? Welcome back to another Hands-On with Maxon Redshift workshop. I'm Ellie and I'm a trainer at Maxon and I'm joined as always with my good friend and fellow trainer, Chad. Chad, how's it going? What's up, Ellie? What's up? How are you doing? And what's I'm up, good, I'm good. Else how you do? I can't believe like we're here again. I feel like I feel like the week just goes so quick between each one. Like I feel like no materials are like yesterday, even though it was last week. Yeah. Yeah, it's always so exciting. It's like the, this is like the pinnacle of my whole week. Don't oh, tell too. my friends and family that, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's all right. It'll be our secret. And the secret now that's going on YouTube. <laughs> no one will know. <laughs> no one will know. <laughs> also, hi to everyone to Burn, Dominic, Sharon, Ahmed, Jay. It's nice to see you guys. Um, it's, it's nice to have you guys with us. For everyone who's watching us live, um, we really appreciate it and appreciate you being part of these workshops with us. And also to anyone who catches this up on our YouTube channel, thanks, thanks for that as well. We appreciate you too. So let's get into what we're gonna be doing. Um, so let's have a look. So for anyone who is new here, uh, we actually have already run part one and two of this Redshift workshop. So we did a getting started, on the 2nd of Feb and then we did node materials last week a whole two hours of node materials I'm not gonna lie that's probably one of my favorite sessions like I really Ooh. enjoyed just diving into building materials in Redshift I think it's just like when it clicks I think it's just so much fun um, to mess with and I did just want to kind of like take this opportunity to to show you guys that you can actually catch these up on our Max on Training Team YouTube channel so if you guys don't know this you don't know this already we as a maxon training team we have our own youtube channel where we put everything or pretty much everything that we do on there from things like ask the trainer like max has got a new show max on color we've got vfx and chill we have demystifying post-production which is a different series every single month we like to do as much as we possibly can um, with you guys and so we record all of those and we throw them on there and so if you did want to catch up on part one or part two, or just kind of like dive into some of the parts, then we have a hands on with Max on specific playlist on that channel. And so, you know, you can you can check those out as well as if you're new to C4D entirely, we have a beginner's workshop uh, on there as well. We've got sort of like six parts of that and it's run in the same way as we run this hands on Redshift workshop. And Chad, you know we have to shout out Dr. Sassy, don't we, today? We have because to. Because for anyone who doesn't know, pretty much everything on our YouTube channel is time stamped. And so that means you can come down, there's this lovely little bio down here, and you can actually pick a specific section and learn about a specific topic from this two hour session. And Sassy, actually does this for us and so these last few sessions he's been doing this i can't take the credit me and chad can't take the credit for this he does this for us and it is honestly so invaluable and i appreciate it so much and so we actually spoke about this me and chad did because we both had this idea where we're like we have to like thank him on this session so we're all going to thank him now so when he sees this thank you so much sassy i honestly appreciate it so much um, and so does everyone else who then actually uses the timestamps on youtube as well so we just mm -hmm. want to talk about that really quickly cool so getting back to what we're going to be doing so let's have a look at this little overview here so today part three i can't believe we're we're like halfway through we're already on part three it's it's mad it's how quickly it goes and we're going to be diving into a, a bit of like a mix of topics today. We're going to be looking at lights and also some camera basics and then some like cool, fun post effects stuff because, because why not? Why don't we want to learn that stuff? And this is going to give us a nice kind of like final base bit of knowledge ready for part four, which is going to be a little bit different to anything we've done before. But we'll talk about that at the end of this session. We'll get into what we're actually going to be doing. So really quickly, just these extra bits in case um, you are new and this is the first time you're watching the, one of this hands on sessions and cool. Thanks for being here. So these sessions are recorded. We've already just seen our Max on Train team YouTube channel, so you can find those on there. The chances are it's uploaded the following morning. So for me, it's kind of like late in the afternoon. And so it will be kind of uh, hopefully tomorrow morning for for you guys. 
For anyone who doesn't have Redshift, we've actually been extending the trials. And I know there are a couple of people who have emailed in and are waiting for the trial to be extended. Sorry, I haven't actually got around to doing those this week, but tomorrow and Friday, I'll make sure I get all of those extended and done. And I'll extend them till maybe like next Friday. So you'll have a couple of days after the final session as well, where you can still access Redshift. And as always, we have we have project files and we have a bunch of assets for you guys to use throughout this entire sort of workshop, this entire course. And you have unlimited access to all of those. And I'm sure Chad will not mind if you guys need access to those links. Let him know in the questions or in the chat and he can link those. He can link you to those and it'll be this sort of Dropbox here. And you can see we have weeks one to four. And in each one of these weeks, we have an empty scene and we have a final scene where we've been working on each of those in um, throughout these sessions. I just put the link uh, in the chat to um, oh. to the exercise files. Oh, sweet. Thanks, Chad. And so, yeah, if you guys can't see that, then just drop like a question in the questions area in like the go to webinar interface. And then we can we can reply with that link as well, because I know sometimes not everyone can see the chat. But I don't know why. <laughs> so we have some additional assets as well, in particular, this Neo City Kitbash kit. And so this is going to be particularly useful for next week's session. So we'll get back to this a little bit later on and I'll show you what, what actually is in there if we have some time at the end of this session. And then last but not least, I know we talked about this a little bit last week, that you guys asked so many incredible questions throughout this, the, these two hours of this like show or workshop or training session, whatever you want to call it. Um, that unfortunately, we, we don't actually have the time to answer every single one, but I want you to know how important it is that you ask those questions. Like for me as a trainer, like it helps me to know what to teach in these introductory sessions. And it also helps you guys to learn to get these questions answered. So any of these questions that I don't think have been answered in the last like two sessions, I've actually made a Q&A PDF and I've separated them because there's quite a few uh, based on each topic. So if you had some questions from week one, then we have a week one Q&A, which is just sort of like, I tried to keep the answers, you know, like short and sweet for you guys. Um, so if you didn't get your question answered, check those out, whether it was for week one or for week two. And at the end of this whole thing, maybe I'll just accumulate everything together and make one big PDF and then you guys can, can have that. Because there's some really interesting questions, actually, some really kind of useful stuff that maybe we didn't get around to showing or stuff that uh, isn't necessarily introductory, but it's what you want to know because it's how you work inside of C4D or inside of Redshift. So, you know, it's really interesting sort of going through and answering all those questions. And it also allows me to shout out two other guys of the training team, Jonas and Darren, who've been helping me out with these because um, there are a good four or five pages of questions each. So thanks, guys. <laughs> That's so and amazing that you do that. Questions. That's like so generous. Just take all that time to write all that stuff out. That's incredible. Yeah, well, well, you guys, they they take the time to ask the questions. So I want to make sure that, that people can get as much out of this as they possibly can. Yeah. So, sorry, I can't, sorry, everyone, that I cannot answer questions like Ellie can. <laughs> Oh no, no! I'm just no, don't be silly. It's great, for... it's great to have you on here. Yeah. So for everyone, Chad, Chad's the guy that I get to talk to and interact with. I'm <laughs> I'm calling you the voice of the people for this workshop now, because you're That's you're the one sweet. that gets to read these questions <clears throat> and gets to gets to ask and, and it's nice to have someone to interact with as well. That's just you're sweet. I'm like nice I'm like one it. step above like if there was like a mannequin with like a springy head. They're just going to sat here. I'm like one tiny, tiny incremental step above that. <laughs> I, that is completely not true. <laughs> so you know, as I was saying, if you guys want access to all of these links, it should be in the handout section. But if you can't see that, then yeah, literally let us know in the questions or in the chat. And then Chad will be able to drop any of those links for any of that stuff for, for you guys. So today, what are we going to be doing today? We've got another another two hours together. Where we can dive into some some even more interesting topics inside of Redshift, and it's going to be a little bit of mix of things. But I feel like they all they all go quite nicely together. And so what we're going to be doing is we're going to be diving into first of all the different light types inside of Redshift. And so we've already sort of looked at the dome light, 
where we can light with like a HDR image. And we've also had a little look at area lights. So we'll dive into those a little bit more again, uh, just and, and have a look at the actual settings and the actual different parameters that we can that we can mess with when it comes to working with our lights. Then we'll look at the Sun and Sky Rig, which is a really powerful tool inside of inside of Redshift, as well as going into probably one of my my more more fun and favorite topics, which is volumetric lighting. And we're going to just sort of really mess with our creativity here, creating some global fog and also creating some light beams, which should be um, a lot of fun inside of inside of some of our scenes. And then we're going to sort of change things up a little bit and go into some camera basics, in particular the standard camera and the Redshift camera tag. And then we'll look at We'll look at things like depth of field where we can just add, you know, that that final little one percent of just like really like perfecting our scenes and making that really beautiful render. And then we'll also look at some post effects inside of our render view as well. And the project file for that, we're actually going to look at the getting started project file just while we look at our light types. And then we're also going to look at the lights camera post effects one as well. So without further ado, let's actually get into Let's get into Cinema 4D and Redshift. So I'm gonna switch my camera off so you guys have a bigger screen, but I, I will be back. So let me just, let me just move this out of the way. I have a little go-to webinar interface. Right, so let me open up, let me open up. What are we working on today? So we're gonna work on our getting started scene, first of all. And this is just gonna allow me to demonstrate the different light types inside of a nice looking scene instead of just like a plain, a plain gray viewport, which you know, no one really wants to see, do they? And then we'll get into the other project file in a little bit. So don't forget, let us know your questions. Um, that's what we're here for. And you know, we'll get into learning some, learning some lights. So first things first, what I'm gonna do, I'm actually gonna open up my Redshift render view. And this is just going to allow me to see all these changes that I'm making inside of my viewport and inside of my final render. So if we just kick this off. So this is what we have to start with. And this was our, for, for those of you who remember, this was our part one getting started final project. So we built something similar to this. We didn't build this exact thing. But we first looked at, you know, adding a dome light, adding an area light and starting to create some materials. And so if you want to check that again, feel free to head over to the YouTube channel. But we're going to we're going to sort of like steal some of these, steal some of these things here. Just to check out some of our light types. So let me actually let me switch these off. And so we can see what it looks like with no lights. And as we can see, it's looking pretty ugly, even though we've got our textures in there. So where can we find our Redshift lights? So let me just switch this off for now. So inside of our Redshift menu at the top, if we drop down, we have a lights option. And I'm actually just gonna hit this little bar at the top. And what this is gonna do, it's gonna undock this menu so I can see all of my different Redshift lights. And we can tell they're Redshift lights, not only because we went up to the Redshift menu, but because they have this little red icon. So this is our like Redshift icon. And as you can see in our objects manager, we have that same icon as well as everything starting with RS. Let's do a quick comparison. So I think we briefly did this in, in the first session, but let's just have a little look and put these side by side. So inside of here are our standard Cinema 4D lights. So if you're used to working in C4D, you'll be used to using these different lights. And what's really nice is we have a, a nice little kind of comparison between the two. We have a lot of generic names. And what I mean by that is we have a area light and an area light. We have a spotlight, we have like a IES light and we have like an infinite light and, and like physical sun and things like that. So we have some nice similarities, which is great. So we already, if we're used to using C4D, we can kind of understand already inside of Redshift what exactly these lights do and, and how we would want to start building up our scene. So let's actually take a look at our different light types and the options or the parameters that we have inside of them. So let's just get rid of that for now because we don't need to worry about that. Let's kick off our render view. And so we have, to start with, we have 
four different physical light types. And so those are the top four here. So let's just start with an area light, because this is probably, I'd say, one of the most common lights that you use, whether you use Redshift or any other kind of software. I feel like area lights are, are probably the most common. And so let's just, so all, all I did was click the area light and it's now inside of our scene. And so an area light basically is a light with a real physical size and shape. So let's have a look at our different attributes here. So with our area light selected, our object tab, so we're not really gonna worry about looking at the basic tab or the coordinates tab because inside of C4D or inside of Redshift, these are generally the same kind of thing dependent on the object or the tool that you're on. But the object tab, this is where things um, get pretty important. For a start, we have a preview. So you can see inside of your viewport, we have a wireframe preview, which is, I, I find it's, it's very useful. But if later on, you know, you've got a bunch of different lights and you find they're a little bit overwhelming and you don't, and you don't really need to worry about adjusting your lights anymore, you can actually just switch off your wireframe and just to, you know, tidy up your viewport a little bit if you, if you want to. But for our sakes, we're going to leave this on because we like to see what we're creating. So looking at our intensity, this was a topic that actually came up in week one. We talked about intensity versus exposure. And in the meantime, I've actually kind of tried to learn a little bit more about this to explain exactly what these two settings mean. So intensity specifies the intensity of the light or the number of physical units. And so if we just skip down here, we can see we have our different um, physical units for our light intensity, depending on how we want to work. So that is what the intensity does. The exposure specifies an F dot value, which allows us to increase or decrease a light intensity. And so a value of zero means our intensity doesn't change. Whereas an exposure value of one means the light doubles in intensity. And so to explain that, or to sort of like do a physical um, demonstration of that, if I make my intensity 50 and change my exposure to one, we now have the exact same kind of intensity that we just had with a value of 100 and a value of zero. And we can do that same thing by putting 25 and then putting two. It's now quadrupling that. So we're getting our original 100 intensity. So hopefully that explains that um, in a little bit more, in a little bit more detail. Let's just go back to our original, original options in here. So our decay is our, is our light fall off. And so our physically accurate light fall off is this default setting, which is quadratic. We can then choose to have no fall off, or we can choose to have a linear fall off. And what's cool about a linear fall off, if we then drop down our decay, if we take a look at our render view in here, we can actually control the size of our, of our fall off or our decay. But if we're looking for something that's physically accurate, we can leave that on um, our default setting inside of here. We can, we can tint our lights. So, you know, we can adjust the, the tint or the coloring of our light if we wish to, as well as if you're used to working with um, like real lights in a photographic studio or something, and you're used to working with temperature, which is gonna be in Kelvin, we can actually change our mode to temperature and we can start to adjust our our temperature value in here to get to get different results so it depends on how you work if you're used to working in a in like a photography studio and you like to work with temperature then that's absolutely the way to go or if you're looking for maybe a more kind of artistic user-friendly coloring we can just adjust our color in here let me just set that back inside of there this final option 
we're only going to go through these once. Don't worry, I'm not going to go through this on every single light. It's just, I thought it'd be nice to show once on an area light, just so you guys can see exactly what these different settings do. So we have our area shape and we can see our area shape is represented by this wireframe. So we have a bunch of different options. You know, we have disc, we have sphere, all, you know, relatively self-explanatory, all that come with their own different sizing options. But a cool one that I thought would be good to show is something called mesh. And so if we select mesh, we then get given this sort of, um, it's asking for a, a object inside of here. And so let's just, you know, let's keep it super simple. Grab ourselves a cube. Go back to our area light and drop in our cube. Now what's happening is our area light is taking the mesh shape of our cube and that is now what's creating our light. If you even look in your reflections, we can see the reflection of this cube in here and this is now what's creating our light and so this is handy if we're creating more um okay so let's say we're creating like a neon sign and so we want to have that the the neon tubing working as a mesh light so what you do you create your text or whatever you want to create and you drop that into there but another way or another benefit to using the mesh light is we can really optimize our the performance of our render and what i mean by that is let's say you had what's what's a good kind of like visual okay let's say you have a warehouse that's got a bunch of those like panel lights along the top or like fluorescent lights along the top what you could do so you could create a light for each one right we create an area light for each one if we wanted to and position them and whatever cool we can do that but that would take longer to render than let's say taking a plane or a cylinder, if you're using like a fluorescent tube, putting it inside a cloner, and then putting that inside your mesh light, because then effectively it's optimized because it's only one object inside the mesh, and therefore it's only one light that Redshift is having to calculate at the point of final render. And so you'll find out that that, that would be a faster way of working than if you were to create, I don't know, a different area lights in the shape of like a rectangle or something so that's where mesh can come in handy wow so you could use stuff like a like a cloner as the mesh for yeah. area light yeah wow. and so then it turns all of that into that mesh of that one area light and then it just it just saves on performance because it's not having to calculate all of those different lights because to redshift it's just one light Oh my gosh. There's a great question in the chat here. Um, is it possible to uh, make a selection and have just like selected uh, faces or certain polygons of the, uh, the mesh? Like, I guess, I mean, you probably couldn't use like a selection tag, I'm guessing. Is there a way to do that without like, um, do you like know? destroying the object? It's a really uh, interesting question. You know what? I'm, that's a great question. I'm not sure. I'm not sure whether it needs to be actual like set geometry. Let's, oh, you know what, let But it does work with parametric objects, which is really interesting as well. So it seems like it's, you know, if it's taking objects that are, you know, parametric objects that are in groups or whatever, like uh, generators like cloners, like that seems pretty flexible, it's pretty cool. So let's see, let me just clear this clear that out and let's see oh no it doesn't allow me to add a a um like a selection tag mm, okay unfortunately unless we set it as like a separate piece of geometry yeah that makes sense so, you know if we sort of like split it off and had it as a separate object and you set that object in there then yeah that would work but unfortunately we can't use an actual selection tag inside of this. But that was a great question. Yeah. So Thank if you do want to do that, set it as, create it as a separate object um, and then drop it in there and then that would work. 
cool. Right. So getting back to to this. Uh, so really quickly. So these sort of settings, if you're used to working with C4D Lite, are the same kind of settings inside of there. But we'll run through them for anyone who isn't sure. So one thing to talk about size and intensity. Uh, they they correlate to one another. So, for example, the size of my area light rectangle is is pretty big. And so as we can see here, we've got quite a lot of light going on. But this is also because our intensity is set to 100. If I make my area light small, we get a lot less light. Even though our intensity is still at 100, the size of our light is having a direct impact on the amount of light in our scene. Let's just go back to 200 and 200. If we go to normalize intensity, what this means is no longer is our size having an effect on our intensity. Now we can just increase or decrease the intensity of our light and our light can be any size that we want. These final two, are if you wanna have a visible light in your scene, we can switch on visible. And then bi-directional, so as we can see here, we're only having light coming from this, in this direction, we're having nothing from behind. If we put on bi-directional, we then have a bi-directional light and it's casting light both at the front and at the back of it. Hey, Ellie, cool. I've got another, I got another question. Yeah. So I see that there's the decay. If we go into the linear decay, linear fall off, um, then we can adjust that. And then also under the shape, there's a spread. What's the difference between the uh, decay and the spread? Okay, so the spread is such is a really important feature, and it's used mostly when working with volumetric lighting because it allows us to control the the overall spread of our of our light and so for mm. example when we work with volumetric lighting if i decrease the spread of my light so we can kind of, i i don't know if you can kind of see it here yeah 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 that's a harder kind edge. of see it. um and so if when so when we adjust this setting with volumetric lighting it's a it's the way of creating those you know those like light beams and so we will look at that when we look at volumetric lighting okay and that's I mean, it does like really see exactly what what that's doing that's awesome you know one of the things like coming from like having more experience with cinematography than with 3d stuff it is kind of challenging that there isn't like you know light softeners you can't really soften the light or harden the light you can use an area light and you can make your lights bigger but you can't do things that you would typically do on set to like diffuse light or whatever so like it seems like spread kind of does something ish like that where it's like hardening the light as you reduce the spread so i don't yeah. know I, I could see myself using that even on like regular non-volumetric stuff oh cool yeah and that's a good i didn't think about that but yeah no it is interesting to see the effect that it's having in the in the render view like you said to diffuse that light Amazing. okay Cool, right, so let's have a quick look. So before we get into our details tab, because this is where we can start to look at some different contributions to shaders based on our individual lights, we'll have a, just a quick look at these other light options or these other physical light options inside of here. So what we can do, we can just come into our type and we can change our, our type here. So we can change this and we can have a point light and so what point light is doing is it's it's kind of a way of creating like a light bulb and so it emits light in all directions from a small point in space so we can sort of see that in here if we sort of pull that up slightly and as we can see we get the same kind of options or the same kind of settings that we're used to so we just sort of pull that up and we can see that a little bit better we have a similar kind of set of settings that we had in our in our area light. We then have our spotlight and if we just sort of rotate this round, it will be a little bit clearer to see. So these are very similar to, you know, those lights that we have inside of standard Cinema 4D. So if we just come into here, let me just sort of increase this intensity a little bit. 
and we can see that and then we can adjust our cone angle and our fall off and so if we have a look at our wireframe we can see exactly this inside of our render view because we've still got this play in just so we can see everything that's happening and we can adjust this fall off as well in here and the final one or the final physical light type is our infinite light and so infinite light or aka a directional light is a light source which is infinitely far away from the scene and so it has no position and so if i take this light and if i start to move it around we can see that we are getting no changes inside of our render view and that's because it has no it has no like position it has no set distance what it does have is it has a direction so if we start to rotate this we can see that we can start to get some really kind of interesting results so if i just hit my r key and i start to rotate this we're now getting this infinite light creating these directional rays okay so those are those are like the physical lights that we have inside of inside of redshift let me just i'll leave this open actually and then what we're going to do we're going to take a look at this details tab so this is something we haven't actually looked at yet and this is going to open up a bunch of different options inside of here so let me just actually let's for the sake of this let's change this back to area and then when maybe go to like 50 or something okay that's a little bit excessive maybe like 20 just so we can see this in our scene and see exactly what's happening so we have our shadow options so you may find if you have a bunch of different lights in your scene you may not want every single light to be casting a shadow and this is where like the benefit of doing maybe like product photography comes in handy in 3d so you could set up your key light your fill light your rim light but you could only have one of them casting a shadow so you can create some more kind of creative and artistic results so we can have it cast a shadow or not cast a shadow and what you can see let me just turn this down a little bit more so we can see that a bit more we can see the shadow or we can so we can soften our shadows by just upping this transparency and so hopefully you guys can see let's let's come a bit closer in here so we can really see like what's going on so we can control the transparency or the softness of our shadows as well light groups is something we're going to bypass but we may talk about this next week when we talk about aovs which are like our multi-passes but just to sort of do like a little a little brief thing you can actually set up light groups and then inside of our AOV manager which is our multi-passes we could set up a particular pass for that particular light group and then let's say for example we bring our whole composition into after effects we could then control each of those individual light groups as a different layer and so recently I did a bit of a project on this and I created some flickering, some like light flickering by setting up light groups and rendering those out as separate um, EXR files. So that's where light groups can come in handy. But yeah, well, hopefully if we have some time next week, I'll, I'll try and get around to, to setting up some light groups or um, at least AOVs in general, we'll, we'll get around to. Okay, so hey, this contribution, oh yeah. Um... There's, I'll say, I don't know how to ask this. So <clears throat> there are a lot of questions in the chat and also from me as well <laughs> about um, uh, emissive materials versus uh, actual light stuff. And yep. uh, because, I mean, we've already covered emissive materials um, and you'll probably cover it a little bit again. I don't know if with volumes, I don't know if they like volumes, but you know, so much of what we're seeing with, uh, with Redshift, with lights, uh, mirrors, kind of like a lot of stuff that we can see with emissive materials. 
Uh, and some people feel like more comfortable doing one over the other. Sometimes it's just like more um, helpful. Like, so um, I guess this isn't a very uh, simple, clean, direct question, but I wonder if there's, you know, as you're talking about stuff, if emissive materials can find its way into the conversation, if, you know, like one of the questions was like, can you add emissive materials to the AOV light group or whatever? So just like those types of things. Um, yeah. If you think of like emissive materials, you know, as you're talking about lights, yeah 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 so so yeah emissive materials and incandescent materials can work in a similar way and so yeah i, ju I did just see that question about um emission in AOVs, and without you know I, I feel bad sort of like skimming over this because it's something we are going to talk about next week but inside of your aov manager this is where you can select your particular aovs emission is an aov that we can then render out as a separate pass so we can have all of our emissive materials and we can render that out separately as well as controlling our different light groups so yes we can set emission as um an aov as well so i just really quickly want to answer that question sweet thank you so yeah, so emissive materials, so we, where we set up our materials. So you can see here, I've got some emissive materials. And so if I just switch off this area light and we have our emission in here. So this, this is our, really quickly, this is our emissive pink material. So if I go to my overall, we can see we have our emission set up, our emission color and our emission weight. So we haven't got a very high weight. So if we just like really like crank this up, we can see if we look at this reflection on the floor, we can see how this emissive material is actually casting light on the floor and on the rest of our objects here. And so, yeah, this can be set up as a separate AOV. But there's also a, another material, which is a incandescent material, which is also can work as a light source. So if I just throw that on there. we then have an incandescent material. So there's a, there's a variety of different ways of sort of like working with lights and rendering lights inside of inside of Redshift. So let me just switch that. Let me just try and cut back to where we were. Wow. There we go. So in, in, in like in like one sentence or just like a couple of words, like what's the, the general difference between an incandescent material and uh, a regular material with a bunch of emission on it? Um, do you know, I'm not sure of like the, the kind of exact um sort of like technical info but okay we don't have to, we don't have to is, dig into it it was just no this this is where i feel like shameless plug i can now plug the documentation um which we could link in here and we have our so different helpful. shaders so let's go to our like incandescent material shader here so it's basically an optimized emissive mesh so where the other one it's it's sort of by it saying it's optimized if you're only looking to create a light with a material you're going to use your incandescent but if you want to add other like nodes or textures or roughness elements to it then you would use your normal standard material with then an emission on top or if you're creating like let's say what could be a good example let's say you're creating like a tv screen and you want to have mm. like this particular like diffuse color texture plugged into your um diffuse color on here you mm. could then plug that same texture map into your emission color and then increase your emission and it's going to look like you have you can see something on the tv with then that emissive light coming out of it so let's say you had a tv in a dark room mm. you could then set it up that way so if you're only looking to create like light with a mesh you can use the incandescent so yeah that is um, phenomenal documentation for the win Thank here you. <laughs> i'll put that link in the chat to the redshift documentation sweet thanks it's um it's literally my go-to because you know we we sadly i wish i knew everything but i i do not but the redshift documentation is a really nice kind of artist and user-friendly way of of learning and seeing exactly the technical side to how and why some of this stuff works. 
cool right so okay so let's get back to what we're doing so yeah we had a look at that emission we had a look at how we can set that emission in our aov but that's definitely something we will look at a lot more in detail next week i feel like yeah aovs is, is quite like a cool topic that has been asked about a lot in in the questions so we will definitely definitely get to that so back to our details tab um so yes contribution that's where we got to wasn't it looking at the different contribution options inside of here and one thing to mention i'm just going to talk about these once because dependent on the light that you have you pretty much get the same kind of contribution settings so this is our dome light and you can see we get similar sort of options as our area light and so these are our ray contributions and so each of these relate to the contribution that this light has on the rays in our or the shaders in our in our scene and so if you work with matte shadow surfaces, we can enable or disable that inside of here. We then have the ability to have um, to control how our specular reflections are affected by rough or refractive objects that block our light. Uh, and so we can control whether our light rays bend as they pass through or whether they don't bend. And the purpose of this is uh, an important factor when it comes to rendering things like realistic looking glass. So you know how our, our rays pass through an object and how they bend and all that kind of stuff. Um, and so we can control whether that, that does or doesn't happen or automatically happens. So if we set it to never, basically our rays aren't gonna bend, not gonna be physically accurate, not gonna be realistic at all. If we set this to auto, our specular rays are going to bend if um, objects are not too rough. And if we set this to always, our specular rays are always going to bend through our refractions, regardless of any of our ray roughness. And so the important thing here, this setting can only be affected or changed if you're working with a dome light or an area light. If you have any of the lights, you won't be able to see that inside of there. Moving down, we have the ability to enable and disable all of these different contributions on shaders. So diffuse, reflection, if you work with subsurface scattering, ah, the dreaded subsurface scattering, we can control our light um, contribution on transmission, single scattering and multiple scattering. If this is something you want to know about, next month, uh, for anyone who, who would like to know, we are running a demystifying post-production series on Redshift and we are diving into some slightly more intermediate topics. So we're looking at rendering volumes. I know we've gone off on a bit of a tangent here, um, but you know how we're allowed to do that. We're going to be looking at rendering volumes, um, C4D and X particles, as well as particles all inside of Redshift. We're also going to be diving into subsurface scattering. And finally, we're also going to be diving into creating some beautiful layered and stacked materials with um, Leonel and Dustin. So, you know, if you want to check those out, then then cool. And so we'll talk about these different settings in there without having to get into it, you know, today, because it is a it is quite a big topic. It's quite an intermediate topic as well. And then finally, we have this volume contribution, and this is going to be really, really important when it comes to looking at volumetric lighting and volumetric scattering. So at the moment, this isn't having an effect at all because we haven't got any of that set up in our scene. And so these contribution things, if you're wondering why we're talking about them, it just gives you that, that extra control of each individual light inside of your scene. But if you're first learning Redshift and you're first starting to create lights and create things in your scene, do not worry about these settings. Do not worry about adjusting them if you're, if you're unsure. Just get used to creating lights, get used to the settings inside of your object tab. And then when you start to like progress and you start to wanna get control of each individual light, then definitely then check out this, these details tabs and start to affect our contribution. Okay, cool. So we've had a look at those parameters. We've sort of like dove into there. Now let's now let's have a look at the sun and sky rig. Let's let's look at something 
let's let's start to create something cool inside of here. We'll start to mess with this. So I'm actually just going to switch off my lights, and I'm just going to I'm going to get rid of that light. And so we've got nothing lighting our scene now. So let me let me give myself a bit of room. Hey, Ellie. Can sort of. Yep. Are you going to um talk? I know you covered uh, dome lights in week one. Are you are you going to um get into that at all again, or are you planning on not doing that since you did it already? Um, I, I don't, I wasn't going to, but I can do, I could quickly go over a, the dome light and the HDR. Uh, cause I, um, there was one question in the chat that was interesting, like, can you blur, um, uh, an HDR in the background? Um, and, and also to, you know, with the dome light, uh, I was curious about, you know, where the light is coming from and like what exactly it's doing on kind of like a more a more smarter <laughs> level than uh, we did for week one. Yeah, so these, so a lot of these can actually, I think are all answered in the week one Q and A. Okay. We had a whole bunch of questions about the, like the dome light in particular. So for example, this question here about um, the dome light from like a physical point of view. So basically the dome light is a vector and it's an infinite light. So it has, so this was information taken from Adrian, who is like our absolute redshift guru. And so effectively the dome light works as an environment as opposed to an object which has a calculatable distance. Okay. Wow, that's fascinating. Okay, thank you. Okay, that's good. <laughs> okay. Uh, and so when it, like regards to blurring like a, a HDR image, you could create you could create that same effect by when we add like depth of field. So later on when we add depth of field, remind me in case I forget, I'll add a dome light with a HDR and then we'll use depth of field and that will then create a, a blurred background if our HDR is visible. Okay. So that could cool. be a way of um of like faking that. Cool. Thank cool. you. No worries. Um, right, so talking about the sun and sky rig. And so what I'm going to do, I'm not actually going to come into creating my physical sun here. I'm actually going to do it inside of the object. I'm going to create the whole sun and sky rig. And um, once I do that, if I just pull this over slightly, I'm trying to give myself as much room as I physically can. We then have our redshift sky and we have our sun, which is actually a child now of our sky. So redshift creates this all for us. And we now have this inside of our scene and it creates some really nice, realistic looking lighting results. And so let's have a look at our redshift sky. Cause what you notice, if I click the redshift sun, everything is grayed out. And that's because everything, when we use the rig, gets controlled by the sky. And so what we can do, we can, again, we're gonna just, you know, bypass basic and coordinates and let's have a look at our sky here. So we have our intensity multiplier and all of these are, you know, the general settings are kind of similar to the other light settings. So we can increase or decrease the intensity of the light in our sky. So a value of zero, we're gonna have nothing. And then we can increase this um, to as much as we want to, to do, basically. If you don't want to use like physically correct um, camera shaders, we can use non-physical intensity and then we can still um, adjust our intensity to how we visually want to see it. But for the sake of this, I'm just going to, you know, leave it as physically accurate because that's what I want for my realism. And change that back to one. And then we have we have a model. We have two different model types. Hosec, which is our default, is the newer, more, let's say, more realistic looking option, um, especially when it comes to things like creating a sunset or a sunrise. Whereas if we click our other one, we can see that it's it's slightly less realistic. However, you know, it's we're artists at the end of the day. So it's whatever works for you and your scene and the shot and the mood that you're trying to create. There is no kind of, oh, cause this is the new realistic one. I'm going to use this one. You might find that this one creates nicer results for you. 
And so definitely have a little look through the two and see um, and see what works for you. So these next options, this is sort of like the atmosphere that's created inside of our inside of our scene. And so and so just sort of like briefly to explain what each of these is, turbidity is the haze in the air. Um, so two is our default, and that is a nice, lovely, clear blue sky that, you know, we never get in England. And we can make this larger, and so we get a more, I don't know, like, dirtier, more hazy looking effect. Let's turn this back. And then we have the amount of ozone, which is in our atmosphere. So if we have small values, we we can create the more more of like that orangey feel from our from our sunlight. Uh, and then the opposite, you know, if we go further, we can create more blue, which I'm hoping you can see in the render view. It's very, it's not super visible, but hopefully that can be that can be seen still in there. Yeah, it's subtle, but you can see it. Oh, sweet, thanks. Also, a little a little tip: if you ever forget what the default setting was. And you don't want to have to worry about you know doing your whole like command z to undo you can actually just right click or highlight a bunch of different options and right click and reset to default and this will set those to the default settings this works inside of materials or anything inside of redshift you should have the ability to reset to default or reset all of them as well cool moving on we have our horizon height and so let's say if we want, like we're creating a scene where we're on top of a mountain, we're gonna want to make our horizon height lower. So it gives that impression that we're higher up and vice versa. And then we also have the ability to blur our horizon. And this, this comes in handy when we work with like volumetric lighting. So if you can see like the line of your horizon, you'll see where that meets the volumetric lighting sometimes, and you can get a weird little line and that's obviously not like a very nice or desired effect and so you can actually just blur your horizon line if you want to if you do get that strange line in your in your scene and these last few settings are just like our color settings we can adjust ground color we can adjust our red and blue shift inside of our adjustments as well as our saturation cool so moving on to the sun. Ellie, you might have answered this already. I was like looking yeah. at the questions in the chat, but is there a way to um, add an HDR? Because I love the way that the sky sun rig lights stuff, um, but then a lot of times like I want to change the, the background. It'd be really cool to like, I don't know, integrate like the lighting from the sun sky rig with like an HDR background, or is that like a dumb idea? no that's cool so what you could do is you could take the dome light and so inside the dome light we have the ability to add a backplate and what the backplate is is it's not going to add any lighting it just works as like imagine i'm just putting like a background in my scene oh so i could enable my backplate drop in my texture in here and then we may actually have to like reduce then these. So we so it's not actually lighting our scene. Okay. And then our backplate is then just a image in the background for us to see. So in our dome light, we can light with a HDR and have a different backplate, or we could just use the dome light in the backplate mode to have that here. And then, yeah, like you said, because I think even in last week's scene, I'm using a dome light and the sun and, a, and the redshift sunlight because I wanted to create, you know, through the like the blinds, I wanted to create that lighting effect. Mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. So all of this stuff can be used like in conjunction with each other. So is that if, like if you were like on your own and you were making like your own sky or whatever for your own outdoor scene, is that your typical workflow where you'd use like a dome light backplate and then also? The sun and sky rig or how do you do that so oh god there's like so there's so many different ways of doing this so 
this is actually something I did want to I did want to show. So this was a different this is a uh, render that I did a while back, and it's it's going to help me explain some different like light types later on. But you can see this this like image here, yeah. Mm -hmm. So that is that is actually on a plane on a I think it's on like a spline mask on the outside so I so that is what can be vis visually seen but that isn't lighting anything in my scene and then I'm using the sun and sky to light the rest of this scene mm. and so so one way of doing it you can you can fake it that way and so I knew I could fake it because I've only got this window here right and I just adjusted um the sizing and the scale of everything so it kind of looked like it matched but this is this is literally this is a, this is a jpeg <laughs> I okay like I'm, I feel like I'm admitting things that i shouldn't admit this is a jpeg no it's great, which I use it's great. on so a plane helpful. and i use oh not a spline mask sorry a spline wrap so i wrapped it round to give that um sort of dome light <laughs> effect but i didn't want right. it to be like a 360 dome light i just wanted to use the spline wrap and wrap it around part of my part of my shot. So that would be one way of doing it. Okay. And so yeah, so dropping it on there. Or like you said, use the dome light in back plate and you can drop your texture in there. Because yeah, more often than not, you'll find the HDR that you like the lighting for, you won't like the way that it looks. That's just unfortunately one of those things. And and I've and I've been there, we've all been there. And so you might want to add a different sunrise or sunset texture inside of your back plate and then light either with a different HDR or light with the redshift sky and sun. And it's going to then do a, a mix and a comparison between those. Mm -hmm. And so there are like a, a bunch of different ways of doing it. Okay. So like, like I mean, so it sounds like you like don't have like a go-to always like default solution for creating like exterior environments like you kind of mix it up and use all these tools yeah. okay yeah, it cool. depends it depends on the scene like if i was creating some big landscape where i can see the whole thing then i would go with the back plate in the dome light because you want it to kind of be that complete 360 all the way around right that sort of like pano shot but mm -hmm. for this one, because I knew I literally all I'm seeing is this through the window. And so I was like, okay, cool. I don't even need to worry about creating like a whole like dome light back plate. I'm just going to create a plane with a spline wrap. And then I wrapped it round this small little area that I could see. And then I adjusted okay. the settings just to, to literally fake it. That's so, amazing. Yeah, depends a lot on the on the kind of scene that you're creating and how much it's worth building everything okay now for the for the back plate is there a way to like fiddle like there's i don't see any like you know uh horizontal vertical fiddling things like there's not doesn't seem like there's much way to adjust kind of like the placement of the back plate or um any kind of like fiddling like that? No, you know what I'm talking that about? is like sometimes like yeah, the HDR comes in is. and it's just like you're looking at a wonky part of the sky in the background or something like that, and it's just like I just want to fiddle with it a little bit and yeah. So you can adjust, well. you can adjust the rotation, but because it's a vector and because it has no distance, you can't then move it. Mm. Um, like on like the y-axis for example you'd need to move your entire objects up and then move your camera okay. up and then that would work but the way around that would literally be yeah if you wanted to use you could use the spline mask and use like a plane and just sort of have that like that and then you can use like um god i'm testing myself now spline wrap oh. deformer and then Sorry, let's I didn't say mean for I you to go like on a big. I didn't mean to like derail you this no, much. Just... Oh no, 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 no! It's it's. I feel like sometimes I just sort of like explain things. I think, uh, no, I should just show it. And so what you could do is, I could draw without actually drawing it. I could draw like a curved spline like that, like a um, what's what's the word? Like an arc. Yeah, like an like an arc basically. Drop that okay. spline in there. 
and then this plane would effectively take that arc shape right which is similar yeah. to like if i created like a like half a circle that would effectively be like half of my dome light right and so i could put my hdr or not my hdr my any texture on here and then i would have my control then of that texture so i could control then my scale my position my rotation and then i can position this exactly where i want gotcha got the wrong thing there so i can then position that to create that effect and that's pretty much what i did with that shot there and so if you want that amount of control i would just do it that way and then yeah you just create your material with your jpeg on drop it on there increase your resolution and then that's the way i would do that oh my gosh that's amazing because, yeah, unfortunately you can't adjust those things in the dome light because it's like a vector gotcha okay cool amazing cool that's cool stuff to know though i'm sure it's super useful for everyone else as well so yeah so let's have a little talk about the the sun options so you know as we said we can't actually adjust our sun options inside of inside of here we have to do it inside of the actual sky and inside of our sun so we can control the intensity of our sun as well as the scaling. So let me, have we rotated this? Let me let me see if I can rotate this and see if I can see it. Where is our sun? There it is. Okay, cool. So now this is gonna make a lot more sense because we can physically see it. So we can adjust the scale of our sun Oh, that was a bit crazy. And then we can also adjust our, um, like our sun glow intensity, which is the glow around the sun to create that nice like atmospheric effect. Obviously these are very dramatic, just to give the idea of these different things. So we reset those to the default. And so what we can do, and so sometimes I like to work with the redshift sun because I think it creates a really nice, realistic looking effect. What we can do is we can even pull the sun out and then we don't have to use the sky if we don't want to. Like, so, you know, you were saying, Chad, like you could mix this with a dome light with like a HDR on, and then you could still really? then use the redshift sun and control this rotation of that sun to create some really cool, nice effects inside of there as well. Okay, right, so, 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 we had a question last, or oh, was it last week, or was it week one? I'm forgetting, but it was about someone saying, can you use like the GPS coordinates inside of like the redshift sky or the sun rig? And as we can see, no, we cannot, we don't have the ability to do that inside of redshift. However, this, this is, I think, something that maybe not everyone is aware of inside of Redshift. Let me just get, let me just delete that. So at the moment, we have nothing lighting our scene. If I come into my standard Cinema 4D light options, we have a physical sky. And the physical sky has been optimized to work with Redshift. So if I select my physical sky, we can now see that this is working exactly as it should be. And I just really like the result of this. I think it's really nice and really clean. And so this, this isn't a redshift, this isn't a redshift thing or tool or feature or whatever. This is the physical sky from standard Cinema 4D, but it works inside of redshift. And what this means is we can then be affecting time, location, latitude, longitude, and it's going to be working inside of here. So we don't even need to use the sun and sky rig. We can be using this one that we're potentially already used to. Because I know people really like this, really love the ability to control time and location. And I've always wondered, can it be done in the sun and sky rig? Well, you don't have to worry about it. You can just use physical sky. And so hopefully that answers that question that you can then adjust these different settings 
inside of there and it's going to work and it's going to look really nice that's amazing there actually were a lot of questions about that today too so nice. yeah i feel like it's quite it's a very common thing and so i was thinking okay i should really like talk about the fact that it can be done and you can just use the normal physical sky without having to try and do the same effect just with the redshift one that's cool um right oh my god like we can't move it's been an hour already right let me <laughs> Let me really quickly, I want to talk about like two other extra things before we get into volumetric lighting. And that is, or they are, our final two light options inside of here, which are is an IES light and a portal light. So let's just do a portal light first because we're not actually going to, I'm not actually going to demo that, uh, but I will demo the IES light. So back to this shot, the reason I got this render up is because this is lit only using a um the redshift sun on the outside we have a tiny little light here but it's only lit and it's a complete interior scene and so the trouble is when we when we work with interior scenes and we have just kind of like a light source or one light source outside and in our case we've only got this one window that's allowing the light to come through we can get some we can get a lot of noise and a lot of grain so if, if you work with interior scenes this is absolutely going to be kind of like a a lifesaver for you the, what the portal light can do is it basically assists us it works as a virtual window to assist with indoor gi so indoor global illumination and so what it does, it casts light into a room from our environment outside. And so in our case, outside is our like is our sunlight or our sun and sky rig. Or if you're using a dome light, it does the same thing. And it's going to give us that extra bounce of GI um, and give those extra rays to create a noise-free effect. And the reason that, that this portal light is so helpful is if we weren't using the portal light to create the same effect or, or to create the same noise free render, we would need to increase our GI rays and our GI bounces, which is how much our light is going to bounce around in our scene, right? The trouble is, the higher we go with those settings, the slower our render is going to be, because naturally that's just what happens when we look at rendering. And so the portal light allows us to not have to increase those settings as high as we would need to, because it gives us that kind of that, that freebie bounce. And so interior scenes, you work with your portal light. So what I did here was I literally just positioned it over my window and it created some nice, it sort of like draws that light in and lights this scene in here. It sounds so like it's kind of like, like in a... It's like a smarter ambient light, like a like a new and improved ambient light type thing. Sort of. It doesn't. So it doesn't cast light itself. So you would have to have like your your light preset up. So in my case, I had the sun and sky rig, or you'd have to have your dome light with a HDR set up, and then the portal light assists with casting that light into an interior room. Okay. Okay, cool. So you would have to use the two um, like in conjunction with one another. Great, thank you. Uh, yeah, no, no worries. Cool, so finally, let's have a little look at an IES light and how we can set that up. And so let me just, for the sake of this, create a new scene and set this to redshift. And we're gonna grab, I'm just gonna create this like super simple here. And an IES light, so. What, what is an IES light? Well, basically, in, it stands for Illuminating Engineering Society. And basically what it means is we can take IES data to represent the distribution of light from a source, which is going to be this source here. And so we can find light profiles online, but we also have some inside of the asset browser. And what it does is Redshift is gonna take this, what's called an IES profile, and it's gonna use that to define the light's intensity and distribution. And what that means is we can create these really nice sort of realistic lighting effects based on um, these, these light profiles. And so inside of IES light, you know, we have the same settings that we're used to, but we also have this IES profile. And let me just like 
pray that we have something in the asset browser, which I'm pretty sure we do. IS lights, I'm just gonna click through a bunch of these. Okay, cool, right, here we go. So we have these light profiles and it gives you a, a nice little thumbnail preview of what this light is going to look like. And so what we're gonna do, let me just drag and drop that into here and it's just gonna really quickly download. And we can kick that off. Okay, right, so what I'm gonna do, let me just drop this against here and I can tell it's the wrong way around. So let me just rotate that. And we can see because we have this white line, hopefully you can see this white line is the direction of the light. And then we also have this wireframe. And so what's happening is Redshift is taking this IES light profile. Where's my asset browser gone? Switch that off. And it's, it's using it to define our light intensity and distribution. And, and if you were to try and create this with a with like an area light or a mesh light, it would just be pretty challenging to do. And so you can just add whatever profile from online or from the asset browser to create these cool results. And the, the, the best thing about this is it interacts with geometry in your scene. So if I grab myself a torus and make it super small, What we can see is if I pull it down, hopefully you guys can see that this light profile is now interacting and being affected by the geometry in my scene. And so this is what we have here. We have an IES light profile on this bulb. And because we have this really cool like geometric like shade, we're getting this really interesting profile on this back wall and you know if we wanted to do this with like area lights it would just be I mean I don't think it'd be possible I think it should be really hard and so that's what um in in kind of like in, in short that's what um we can do with IES lights and how we can create these nice looking realistic profiles um in there cool so yeah I don't want to go into too much detail about the rest of those because I do want to get into some some volumetric lighting stuff and i am very quickly running out of time so let's get into let's get into creating volumetric lighting so let's move on to our lights camera post effects scene so i'm going to create i'm going to open up my empty scene and i'm going to open up my final scene Let's just have a little look at what this looks like. So I set this up and I've and I have exaggerated a lot of the stuff. So like the fog and the light beams, just for the purposes of this training session, just so we can see all this stuff inside of here. And we're gonna look at how we can set some of this up now inside of Redshift and how exactly this is gonna work. So we're gonna do this in our plane scene. And so let's just kick it off and what we're going to do so we can see things nice and clearly so you guys can see things nice and clearly we're just going to throw in a plain old dome light just so we can see everything that's going on so what what exactly is volumetric lighting well basically the the world and the space around us um isn't empty we can create atmosphere and as light travels through this atmosphere um, it can it can be absorbed and it can get scattered, which is why we call it volumetric um, scattering. And so what we can do is we can use volumetric scattering to control the different light properties inside of this kind of space or atmosphere around us and therefore its effect on our lights. And so with this information and with this kind of like effect, we can create fog or like a global fog and we can also create light beams and so how exactly do we set this up so what do we need to do to set up some volumetric lighting or scattering in our scene so first things first we need to create or we need to add a redshift environment object and this is going to allow us to then control and get access to volume scattering. 
So how do we do that? So for a start, I have a light in my scene. So this is, this is important. I have my dome light in my scene. I'm gonna come into Redshift. I'm gonna go into objects and then we have our Redshift environment. And I'm gonna select that and everything's gonna go white. Okay, cool. So why is this happening? What, what's happening here? So before we get into the Redshift environment, before we're even gonna, even gonna look at any of these settings, because there's no point in changing them really, because everything's kind of white at the moment. And that's because we need to go into our light source. So whether it's your dome light, whether it's your um, area light, whatever, we need to go into that and we need to go back to our details tab. And this is where our contribution settings come into play. And this is why we looked at them earlier. And so at the very bottom, we have a volume contribution scale, um, contribution um, setting. By default, it's set to one. I don't know why by default it's set to one. It used to be set to zero. And so what we're gonna do, because one is a very excessive amount, as we can see here, everything's kind of crazy. So what we're gonna do, let's just pull this all the way down. So at the moment, now our light is having no effect on our volume scattering. It's having no contribution. And that's what we need. We need a light with a certain amount of volume contribution combined with our redshift environment. And that is how we create our volumetric lighting. These two things go hand in hand together. We need, we need them both, basically. So as we can see here, inside my light source, we have no volume contribution. So we can see everything as normal as we could before even though we have our redshift environment. So what I'm gonna do, so low values here are very important. And so if you're like me, I'm very trigger happy when it comes to these sliders. I love to just pull sliders, like that's just, that's how I like to learn. But when it comes to this contribution, this volume contribution, we need to work with low, low values. So what I'm gonna do, I'm actually just gonna hit this little, this little arrow icon here, up. So we have 0 0.001 is our value here. And we already have a quite a significant difference if we look at like a comparison between the two. And so we can start to increase this even more. And then now what's happening is this, this light source, our light source here is having a higher contribution to our volume scattering. And so I'm gonna leave it on 0 0.003 for now. And then what we can do is this is gonna allow us to be able to see some of the changes if we then start to adjust our Redshift environment. So this is where we can now control our volume scattering settings overall for our, for our fog or our whatever we wanna be creating. So our general settings. So we have the ability to tint our, our volumetric lighting. So, you know, we could, you know, do a little bit of like pink in there if we wanted to. And so we can start to create, we can start to like mess with this, like as artists and as creatives, we can start to, you know, um, create some, some more kind of stylized effects as opposed to some more realistic results. So let's just go back to white for now. And before we move on, it's, I feel like it's actually also important to mention that let's say you're working with a dome light or any other light, the colors inside of your light are also going to colorize this. So let me go into my final scene file. And so this was the HDR on our final scene, as we can see lots of lovely colors. If we throw that into our dome light, no, we don't want a path. We can now see that the light of our dome light or our HDR, the colors of that light are also now having an effect on the colors of our volumetric scattering, AKA our fog. So that was something I just wanted to show. Let's go back. Let's go back to, to this one in here, just so we can really see everything as it happens. So yeah, different ways of tinting and they can work side by side. So we could tint with the dome light and then still control some overall tint inside of here. 
And the same as if you have um, an area light with some color on it, which we'll look at in a second anyway, that will also be tinting your um, fog or your volumetric lighting as well. Okay, these next three, these next three options. What are these words? What on earth do they mean? I remember when I was first learning this, I was like, what? I don't really understand. So what they basically mean or what they basically do is scattering. Think of scattering it as how strong our volumetric light is going to be. So if we have a value of zero, we pretty much have nothing going on versus a value of one, we have a crazy amount of volumetric lighting going on. So think of that, you know, as sort of like our strength slider. Attenuation is, controls both the strength of our fog and the amount of, of fog or the amount of light that gets um, attenuated or passed through our atmosphere or our space around us. If we have a higher number, we're going to get a sort of like a thicker fog and therefore more light is being attenuated or passed through versus, you know, having none. So we can really pull this value up. We can start to get some like really sort of like thick fog effects here. And then finally, phase is how much our light is going to bounce around and scatter around our atmosphere or, or the space around us or our objects in our scene. And so what we can do, so by default, it's set to zero, which means um, the light's going to bounce around more. And then what we can do is we can do a positive value so if we enter like a positive value, we get what's called forward scattering. And so our light is more visible towards the camera versus the opposite, where we get a negative value, which then we get backward scattering, which means the light's more visible as it travels away from the camera. So all of these settings are how exactly we would adjust our volumetric scattering and adjust our, our sort of like fog controls. So moving down. So let's just, let's leave this as it is now. I got, that looks kind of cool. So moving down, we then have specific fog settings. And we're not gonna worry about contribution because this is like, we've already sort of looked at contribution um, options. So our emission, the way that I look at emission is we can, Basically, we can make our fog or our volumetric lighting um, self-illuminating. And so as it's set to black, we, we're basically not illuminating our, our fog any more than, than like the light sources. But if I start to, if I leave it on these sort of like these values here, if we start to come up to here, we're now getting a more illuminating or lighter looking fog that we can see in here versus black which is you know no color or off we can also adjust the height of our fog and so at the moment it's we have like an all over global effect because our height is set to zero we can then set some height and so if you had like i don't know like a like a swamp scene or like a murky looking lake and you want to have like some fog just over the top this is where you'd want to control your your height setting as you can see here we we no longer have any fog up here in our sky we only have it along this sort of like floor base here and if we're working on a large scale scene as we said earlier you can get that line between your horizon and your fog and so we could just blur that what we can see here we get that nice blurred effect as opposed to that like straight line along the middle, which can look kind of strange. And then also we can control a ground point and a ground normal, which is where our fog can start and also the direction of our fog as well. So let me just reset those to the default. Okay, so what else can we do here? How can we take this a step further? 
Well, we can actually use, let me just switch off my render view for now. We can actually use a, a noise volume material to add some more creative and stylized effects to our fog. So at the moment we have, it, it's very kind of, it's very uniform, right? Which, which if that's what you're after, then that's cool. But let's say we wanted to add a little bit of variation. We wanna add a little bit of kind of maybe like turbulence or something uh, to it. Then we can, we can definitely do that by just adding a noise volume. So if we open up our material manager, I did not mean to press that button. If we press create, then redshift, and instead of going to materials, we're gonna to go to utilities and we're gonna grab a noise volume. And what we're gonna do, we're just gonna open this up to start with and just actually have a look at like, you know, what this is. So I've opened up our shader graph and this is what we have. We have a redshift noise node and this is just a standard redshift noise. So if I grab a, like a noise here, as we can see, it's just a standard redshift noise set to turbulence. And what we've done is we've plugged it into our output, but instead of plugging it into our surface, like we've been doing, you know, with all of our textures last week, we've plugged it into the volume option inside of here. And so now what we're gonna do, let me just kick off my render view. Let's pull this over so we can really see a bit more detail what's going on. What I'm gonna do, I'm gonna throw this noise volume on top of my Redshift environment. And so now, hopefully, hopefully it's clear enough to see through the webinar that we've got some nice variation and change in pattern now on our on like our global fog. And that's because it's taking this noise volume, it's taking this redshift noise turbulence and it's mapping it to our redshift environment. And we're creating some more just maybe some more realistic results, whether you can say it like that, or just more like stylized and varied results by using that. And we can, you know, we can adjust these settings, adjust our, our noise type or our complexity. And we can also even, um, we could animate these as well and create sort of like an animating fog effect if we want to. Right, so now let's take a look at how we create like light beams. So I'm sort of just double checking the time here. And we have half an hour left. Oh God, half hour. Why did it go so quickly, Jad? Right. So let's create That's some. That's so fun. That's why. That's so awesome. <laughs> <laughs> so let, let's create some light beams. This is the final bit we're going to look at when it comes to volumetric lighting, and then we'll move on to like having a having a brief look at um, some camera basics, depth of field, and hopefully time for post effect. So how do we want to do this? Hmm. You know what, just for convenience, I'm just gonna come into my dome light and I'm gonna have no volume effect on my dome light. So this is what we have now. This is what we have going on. And what we're gonna do, we're, we're gonna create sort of like a, a light beam for our headlight. And so the way that we do that is we, first of all, we need to make sure that we have a light source. And so, we were just using the dome light previously as our light source, but now I'm not gonna have that have any contribution. And instead, I'm gonna come up to my redshift lights and I'm gonna grab an area light. And what I wanna do, I want to just change this to a disc. And the re only reason to change it to a disc is because we have these nice round headlights. And I'm just gonna try and like match this. Like I'm not really, you know, I'm gonna be really lazy with this. I'm just going to make it as close as I possibly can to here. You know, if you have more time, definitely, you know, put a lot more effort into this. <laughs> right, cool. Let me just rotate that slightly. Okay, right. So we have that and we can see what's lovely is we have this white line again, which is pointing out so we can see that it's in the correct direction. Okay, right, so yeah, right, that's, I'm not gonna lie, that's not great, but we'll, we'll go with it. So what we're gonna do, we're gonna kick this off and we can, whoops, we can already see this. And that's because, again, you know, in our contribution, we have our volume contribution set to one. 
let's just get rid of that now. Put that in there. Okay, so we have this set to one. And so this value and our intensity value are gonna sort of work side by side. So if I increase my intensity to like 500, we're gonna get a way more intense light going on and it's having a big effect on our volume. And then again, we could pull this down. So it can be, it's basically like a toss up between the two depending on how you want to work or what you want to affect or how much contribution you want this to have, we can mess with our intensity and our volume contribution. And I'm going to leave it on one for now, just so we can really see everything that's going on. And again, hopefully it's noticeable that we're getting that noise volume on here as well. And so if I take this off, we can see how much of an effect that is actually having on there. Cool, so how, how do we make this look a bit more like a light beam? What can we do with our area light now? Well, aside from you know, the normal settings where we can adjust our intensity, we could, we could like colorize this. So we could have this sort of like cool looking pink, fluorescent pink headlight, Let's do that because why not? But it doesn't really look like a light beam. It's just sort of looking like, like if we look this way, it's looking a little bit crazy. And so this is where the spread value comes in handy. So we talked about this at sort of like the start of this session. Um, and by default, it's set to a value of one, which is why we're getting this sort of all over sort of light spread happening and um, what we're going to do if i start to pull this value down hopefully it's visible if we check out our render view here we can see that we're narrowing the spread of that light and therefore because we have volumetric lighting and scouring set up we can physically see this spread now and we're getting this sort of this this light beam or this sort of like headlight piercing through our scene and so this is how we would set up light beams or if you're using I don't know, like stage lighting, for example, and you want to have like a light pointing down, you could work with like a spotlight and then set up some volumetric lighting that way. And then if we even let's come back into here and let's sort of maybe add. So we could do like a combination of the two. So I've added some contribution to now my dome light source. And so now what we have is the area light creating this sort of like headlight beam through our global fog, which is being controlled by our dome light. And then everything is being controlled by the settings inside of our volume scattering inside of our redshift environment, which then also has this lovely noise volume just to add that like cool variation in there. And so that's pretty much what I did on this scene here. You know, we just exaggerated it a little bit more just so we could see everything. So, you know, we've got these crazy, these crazy pink headlights here, which sort of have an intensity of 10. They've got a color tint on, they've got a spread of 0.2 and they have a volume contribution of 0.5. And they all have a couple of different settings inside of here depending on what we're working with and then we also have i think is the dome light doing a little bit yeah so the dome light's doing a little bit to get this sort of all over fog effect as well in there okay chad any any kind of questions on on that in particular before we go into i'm, I'm well aware that we are running out of time very quickly um, uh, before i get into uh, some camera stuff there were um, a bunch of uh, comments and questions that probably better for the Q&A, but um, one of them was a, a very quick answer was, um, can you use Maxon noise and the noise volume? Like when you open up the, uh, yeah, the noise volume, can you um, use uh, Maxon noise as an input for that or does it have to be the redshift noise? No, I'm pretty sure you should be able to use the Maxon noise. Let's Let's test it. This is how I, this is how I answer questions. I just try it out. 
Oh. Also, while you're setting that up, um, I'm guessing that the little uh, diamonds there mean that we can also animate, um, you know, the evolution essentially from After Effects yes. world. But you could animate the, yeah, the noise. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you can. Anything that has one of these little diamonds on, you could animate any of that noise and then create like a really, like a really cool sort of like um, animated, like windy fog effect inside of there sweet and to answer the question yes you can use max on noise so as you can see it would take a little bit more defining only because this like it would need to be scaled up um quite a bit but we can see especially in this headlight that that noise definitely does work as well so yeah it's only when you first create it it comes in as a as default it comes in as um redshift noise but yep yeah, feel free to add a max on noise adjust the settings just make sure you plug it into the volume and then we can get rid of our redshift noise perfect love it thank you so much cool no worries right okay cool so let's get into really quickly let's get into some camera basics this is going to be some cool stuff to show and so what i'm going to do I'm actually just going to delete these and we're going to work on this same shot inside of inside of here we're just going to work on this like a, like our plane car shot okay right so camera settings so this is this is really important so you know let's say we've built our scene built our geometry we've done everything we want to do we've got our lights we've got our textures and we're ready ready to go setting up camera settings and understanding camera basics can just be that that extra little kind of five or ten percent that people talk about at the end of like making a shot we can create some really stylized effects and some really sort of like nice effects by just controlling our field of view or our focal length and these aren't necessarily these aren't like redshift specific things that we're talking about these are just camera basics in general. So whether you work in standard C4D, whether you work in any other third party renderers, these are just really important things to, to sort of to understand and to use to add that final, you know, like we're saying like five, 10% in your scene. So what we're gonna do, actually, let me just for now, let me just switch that off. Let's grab, so how do we, how do we get, a, first of all, how do we create a Redshift camera? Well, first of all, you wanna come up to your Redshift menu at the top. And then we're going to go to cameras and then we have a couple of different options for the sake of this we're only going to be going through standard camera so let's create our standard camera and it's made it it's now inside of our scene so what do we have here so let's have a look at our attributes inside of our redshift camera but what i'm also going to do i'm also going to create a standard cinema 4d camera oh cool Right, so if we take a look at our attributes here of our standard camera and then our redshift camera. Oh wait, it's the same thing. It's the same settings, which is really great. So if we're used to working inside of standard C4D and we're used to working with the standard Cinema 4D camera, good news, it's the same thing. We have the exact same settings. The only difference we have is you, what you may notice is when we have our redshift camera selected, we have this extra little tab here and this tab is because of this tag here so if i just delete that tag all we have is the exact same camera right and so all we need to do to turn to make this or to give us the ability to use our redshift options for example motion blur depth of field and post effects all we have to do is add our redshift camera tag and so if you right click, we can come to redshift tag. So we looked at our redshift object tag last week. And this next one is just the redshift camera tag. And so now we have that redshift camera tab. And so looking at this, so I've just deleted that standard C4D camera because you don't need that. I just wanted to show like a little comparison between the two because there is no comparison. It's the same thing apart from the redshift camera tag. So looking at this, so so we were talking about like our field of view or FOV and our focal lengths, which are really important things inside of inside of like photography or inside of 3D. And so field of view. So if we have a look, field of view basically is how wide or zoomed in our view is going to appear. 
and because of this it's going to also show our objects to appear larger or smaller in our scene and then our focal length is basically going to create so so a longer focal length will create a narrower field of view and a shorter focal length will create a wider field of view and so there's a there's like a direct linear relationship um between them and so what we can do we can start to create some some cool looking results by just adjusting our focal length and so let's kick this off so first of all what i'm going to want to do is i've kicked off my render view I want to make sure with my Redshift camera, I'm looking through it. And so at the moment we can see in my viewport, I've got default camera at the top. And that's because I'm looking through my default camera. I'm not looking through my Redshift camera, but we can fix that by clicking this little icon here. And then it's going to go white. So we're now looking through it. And now we are in our viewport, we have our Redshift camera as our main camera. And that's what we're now looking through. And so now if we start to adjust some of these focal lengths, we can create some, some different looking shots, some different looking effects. So the important thing here is I'm not going to be moving my camera at all. I'm not adjusting the position of my camera at all. I'm only going to be adjusting my focal length. So to start with, we have wide angle shots. And these are really great, you know, generically for like landscapes, cityscapes, all of that stuff. But by no means does that mean that's the only purpose for them. It's entirely down to you guys as artists and your creativity to, to do whatever you think looks cool or looks good for the shot that you want to create. So as we can see here, we've got our super wide focal length and our field of view is now uh, a lot larger. And so we have this wide shot. And so it's not, I've not moved the camera, I've just changed my focal length. So we also, so super wide and wide, you know, the, the generic wide angle, angle shots here, we sort of like, these are our defaults. And then we have, our our classic and our normal lenses so if we go to classic this is our default so when you first create a camera it's going to set itself as classic or we have like a normal lens and so we can see we get this really nice sort of um standard looking perspective but by no means is that a bad thing it's just it creates a natural look and so if that's the sort of thing that you're after then a normal lens or a or a natural looking shot is is the kind of thing you want to go for we can then take it a little bit further by doing portrait or telly and so these are sort of like for our portrait shots or our slightly slightly long shots we can get kind of that nice and nice and close and if we go into telly so we can get these nice things so remember again you know we're not we're not adjusting we're not zooming in at all or moving so we're not moving our camera at all and then finally, we have our super telly. And these are sort of like, you know, um, those like super close up shots. If you're like miles away, like, I don't know, sports, sports photography, for example, like if you're like trying to take a picture of a guy on the pitch or whatever, you're quite far away, you would need one of these, um, these type of like lenses and this type of like focal length. And so going back to our super wide. So now what we're going to do, we're going to look at the same focal lengths, but we're now going to adjust our camera. And so what I'm going to do, I'm just going to come right in here. And so now because, because we have this like super wide lens, but we're really up close to our shot, we can create these really cool sort of distorted looking shots, which I think just look, I think they just look really like cool. Like it may not be like the best thing for like, I don't know, product photography or like whatever, but you can really start to define and mess with some of your different things just by adjusting these different focal lengths, these different camera angles to create the, your desired effect really. And so, so let's just get, let's get like an angle that we're sort of happy with. So let's maybe sort of do, I don't know, something like this. Just sort of got a little normal lens, just looking looking nice and normal and um, natural. So a couple of little like top tips that I wanted to talk about when it comes to working with cameras is let's say, let's say I just spent ages finding this angle. I mean, we all know that I definitely did not, but let's say we spent ages and we love it and this is how we want it. 
one tip is we can actually lock our camera. If like me, you love to forget that you've got your camera or you're looking for your camera and you love to move it around and then go, oh my God, I wish I'd locked it, et cetera. It's now been an hour of moving things around. I'm so annoyed with myself. Well, there's actually something we can do. We can add what's called a protection tag and it's gonna prevent us from moving this camera around our scene, which is you know, probably what I do most in my life. So with my specific camera, here. I'm just going to right click and what we can do, we can actually start typing. So we can type the start of the word protection and what it's going to do, it's going to tell us where that protection tag is and we can see it's in our rigging tags. And so if I select my protection tag, we now have this, this lovely little kind of like no entry sign uh, going on here and what it's doing is if we look at the tag properties, is it's locking our position, rotation, and scale on our XYZ or our HPB. And so now, if I go into my viewport, what I'm going to do with my Redshift camera, I'm going to try and move around. So hopefully you guys can hear me clicking because I'm trying to use my shortcut keys to move around my viewport, but nothing is moving. And that's because of our protection tag. So that is a bit of a lifesaver tip when it comes to working with your camera. But again, remember, if you then do decide that you want to change your Redshift camera, just make sure you delete that tag. And it works on standard C4D as well. Just delete that tag and then we can move this again. So I just, I just moved my camera. Let's say I did that by accident. Let's say I've deleted my protection tag or I didn't have one and I've moved my camera and I'm like, oh man, how do I go back? Doing a edit undo doesn't undo camera movements. It undoes what we've done in our particular scene or our materials or settings that we've changed, but it doesn't undo our camera movement. However, there is a way of undoing that. And if you press Command, Shift and Z, or Z, depending on where you're from, together, we then get our, we then undo our camera movement. So if I accidentally move this round, instead of having to move it back, I can do Command, Shift and Z and it's going to take me straight back into, into that angle or, or that camera um, position. So that's a cool little tip inside of there. Another thing that we can do, so another tip that can come in handy. So let's say we then have a Redshift area light and I want to position this area light but I want my render view to remain like this. What I can do, I can actually come out of my Redshift camera. I can then change this drop down here to be my Redshift camera, lock it, and then I can move around my viewport. I can move my area light around and I can see the effect it's having on my final render. And so this is really handy when it comes to wanting to make adjustments or wanting to move things around easily inside of my viewport. And but to see the direct kind of effect that they're having on on what I believe is going to be my final my final render. One other thing that we can do is if I select my area light, we can come to cameras. And in use camera, we can use a selected object as our camera as well. And so now what's happened is my area light has become my camera. And so this is a really great way of sort of targeting lights. And again, we can see because this is still locked to my Redshift camera, we can see the effect this is having on my, on my final shot. And I can really easily just sort of position my area light or my different lights and see the effect that they're having on on my shot here so let's just delete that and let's come back into into here so those are a couple little um little useful tips when it comes to working with with cameras or comes to working with lights in particular with um the redshift render view there's some little sort of uh, trick trick techniques that we can that we can work with in here Okay, so finally, I don't, I don't think we're going to get to post effects, but maybe we'll have a little look at that at the start of next week. But I do want to get into depth of field because I think this is a really 
a really awesome thing to show inside of Redshift. So what I'm going to do, how do we set up depth of field? So for a start, it's really great. If you want to specify a, let's say we want to specify like a point of interest or the, or the thing that we want to be in focus in our shot. I'm going to come into my Redshift camera and I'm going to grab my little focus distance picker here. So for a start, we can have a focus object. So I could drop my car as my focus object. What I actually want to do is I want to create a even more dramatic sort of uh, depth of field effect. So I'm going to take my picker and I'm going to choose my focus distance. And the important thing here, it's not going to work on your render view. It only works in your viewport. So let's say we want this, what effectively is, what's that, the front left of our car to be in focus. So I'm going to click that. And it's giving me my focus distance of about almost 74 centimeters. And then the next step, so as we can see here, we're not getting any um, depth of field, like nothing's really happening. And that's because we need to go into our Redshift camera tag, or we can go into the tab here. So we, as you can see, we get the same sort of things. We can go into our bokeh, which is our like depth of field effect. And by default, it's not on. So none of these settings are on. But if I override this and enable it, hopefully you guys can see that we're now getting that depth of field effect in our shot. And so let's just sort of talk really briefly or really quickly about some of these, some of these settings. So derive from camera. So we have a couple of drop downs here. By default, we have focus distance and COC radius. And so what this means is because we've um, we've defined our point of interest, right? We defined our focus distance inside of our Redshift camera, which is, you know, this, this front bit of our car. With this option enabled, the Redshift is going to determine the focus distance and COC radius itself. And so what you can see, we get this really nice, clean depth of field effect inside of here because it's, it's working it out based on the settings inside of our Redshift camera. So we can't adjust those. If we change this to none, we now have the ability to adjust these options. So our focus distance, so we can specify um, our focus distance now for our specific object. So if I start to sort of like pull this up, we are now getting a focus distance. COC radius stands for circle of confusion how aptly named. And this controls how strong our depth of field effect is going to be. So if I start to increase this, we can see that we're getting like a really excessive and dramatic um, depth of field effect here. So let's go back to focus distance and let's maybe change that back to one, uh, maybe two. We then have power. And so this, so the way that like the Redshift documentation explains this is if you think of the pixels that are out of focus as disks, the blurrier the pixel, the larger the disk. And so if we increase our power, maybe we need to increase this as well, just to kind of, we can see, so we can now see these out of focus uh, sort of like disks um, even more sort of intense now. And then our aspect is a way of squashing our depth of field. So if we sort of start to pull this up, so if we go higher, we're, we're sort of squishing it horizontally. And if we go lower, we're squishing it vertically. And of course, this is all like super, super dramatic just to show this off. Um, but what we're gonna do, let's, Let's just reset this to how it was before. And then- hey, Ellie, gonna, can, I, uh, yeah. can I interject a question? This is a, yeah. a personal question, but as I was fiddling with this, um, I'm used to like uh, real world cameras where like you adjust the aperture and the aperture controls essentially the, the range of focus, like um, how much, stuff is in focus and i couldn't find anything um with redshift cameras that i mean you could kind of fake it with the coc radius but um there's nothing that says like oh, i want like 
you know, the entire car in focus or whatever. Is there anything like that that kind of gives you a control of like the depth plane of, or just kind of like fake it with the COC radius? So if you wanted the whole car in focus, the way that you could sort of like do that would be to, where are we now? Drop it in as a focus object. Mm. So that's how I would get all of that in, in there. Mm. Um, but I wonder if we could adjust if we have a look inside of here. I don't so mean to I totally, yeah, so, totally derail you. So I, I tend to just mess with these settings and then adjust sort of like, so we have this here and we have like the whole car now in shot by messing with our like CRC radius. And then we could also then adjust our power as well mm -hmm. to, to kind of like create that effect as well. But yeah, you could definitely just drop the car in as like your focus object as opposed to having a specific focus distance. That's very cool. Very cool. Thank you so much. And I think even could we could we do none? And then if we had a higher focus distance. Yeah, so doing that as well. So if we set this to none and adjusted my focus distance because it's now a higher value, we get my whole car in my whole car like this is my car uh, the whole car <laughs> okay <laughs> so awesome. Thank yes you. does that hopefully that answers that a, a little bit yeah i mean like let's say i want to focus on the back wheel of the car um we don't have to spend any more time on this I, but you know if you want to like focus on the back wheel of the car then um, I would love to be able to control like where the bokeh starts, like how far away from the camera the bokeh starts. You know, do I want to start at the front tire? Do I want it to start like in front of me? But I guess, you know, the COC radius kind of functions as a makeshift version of that. Yeah. Yeah, it does. I'm sure there are ways of doing that though, between these settings, um, which I can definitely find out for, yeah, for next week. That's all good. Thank yeah, you so I tend much. To, no worries. I tend to literally just mess with these settings inside of here. Um, but yeah, I'll um, I'll definitely find out though for you. That is not a problem. Sweet. So I'm very aware that it is now three minutes to. And we haven't got to post effects. I'm going to just I don't want to like skip through them. So I think maybe I'll show them at the start of next week's session or it's something I'll dive into like a different time because it's definitely something cool to talk about and to show sort of different like color transform tools inside of inside of here. Basically, we have all these like really cool funky settings that we can that we can control that I wanted to go through in a bit of detail. And so I don't want to rush through those. So I'm not going to um, I'm not going to do those. Only because I'll just end up talking about them next week anyway. So let me let me just I did also want to really quickly talk about what we we're doing next week. So let me switch let me switch my camera back on so I can, you know, you guys can can see me. Hey everybody, how's it going? So I can't believe how quickly this two hours goes. It just it absolutely flies, doesn't it? It's it's insane. It is, it's crazy. It's the fastest two hours of my week for sure. It really like it's mad. Like I'm always sort of like, oh no, I don't know. Do I have enough content to fit two hours? And then I look, I'm like, why is an hour and a half gone already? <laughs> um, I probably should lie about this stuff, shouldn't I? The illusion is um, broken. Um, cool, right? So, so next week, so next week's going to be a little bit different to something that I've ever really done before. I've created a, a bit of like a cyberpunk render. And so if we have a look in our project files, where is this? So inside of here, we've got a bit of like a cyberpunk scene, but feel free to like create your own ready for this, for this shot. And so if we just really quickly, like, I know, you know how I love to overrun. Um, okay. Let me open up. So this Neo City kit bash. So inside of here is 
Shout out to Kit Bash, by the way, who allowed me to convert their free Neo City kit completely for Redshift and distribute it out for this course to you guys. Um, that's really cool of them, and I really, I really appreciate it. And so, what you guys can do, let me, let's see. Hopefully, this doesn't take too long to to load. So, inside of here is the Kitbash Neo City kit converted. So it's just, it's going to take a while to load because it's it's quite a few quite a few textures. So we have all of these different buildings or options inside of here, which all look like super cool, as you can see, and all of our converted textures, which have been converted for Redshift. And so I built this little cyberpunk scene based on some of these options, but feel free to build your own or create your own ready for, ready for next week's session. And what we're going to do is we're going to look at setting up some lighting and some materials for this particular scene. And as you can imagine, in two hours, we absolutely cannot do an entire shot. But what we're going to do is I'm going to talk you through my process and my workflow of how I would go about it and how I did go about it. And so let me even open up which one? Cyberpunk scene final. So I'm going to talk you through my process of how I converted, first of all, these Kitbash assets into redshift because i know this was another topic people were saying how oh when i buy a model like all my textures come in black and there's a couple of reasons one it can be because if they're redshift textures you need to connect the assets together in your project asset inspector or it might also be like in this case all of these textures were for native cinema 4d and so i had to go through and i had to rebuild every single one based on their texture maps as you can see I didn't necessarily use them all. And we build them in a particular way inside of here. So what we'll do, we'll build a couple of them and we'll convert a couple of them because the process is the same. So we're not gonna have to worry about building them all, mainly because we also don't have the time to build them all. And then what we're gonna do, we're going to look at you know, a little bit of lighting. We're not gonna worry about the volumetric lighting because we, we did that this week. And we're also gonna look at creating this, this wet asphalt road here and that uses our 4k puddle maps which are also inside your texture maps and so that's how we create these really like cool looking reflections where our lights are going to hit it and it's gonna it's gonna look really nice and so those are the things we're gonna we're gonna look at next week as well as our advanced render setting so i'm i'm aware that that's something we haven't covered yet and so we're going to dive into um samples or sampling our global settings a lot of um global illumination and then we're also going to look at setting up and rendering out some aovs and then we'll find some time to fit in some post effects i've done that thing where i've probably um given myself way too much to do in two hours but hey why why not i'm gonna try and get as much of that in in next week as possible but also, we have got our demystifying post-production series in Redshift in March, where we'll be diving into, we can dive into some of these things in a bit more detail as well. And so, yeah, check out the project file for that or build your own, whatever, whatever you want to do, like is, is totally up to you guys. Um, and we'll have some fun next week, just sort of, just sort of building and creating some stuff and, and having like a nice time during those two hours, learning some some extra things inside of Redshift that we haven't quite got got around to yet. Um, so yeah, again, I just want to say a big thank you to you, Chad, for being here Aww, and you know chatting with so me, chat, answering like guys' questions, dropping those links in there. Like it, it wouldn't be the same without you here. So I really do, I really do appreciate it so much. For it's my privilege um, to be here. I love it. And thank you to everyone else who's like watching us live. Everyone that's still here. Like, I feel like I've, I've, we always overrun now these, like, I feel like it'd be rude not to. So, so thank you to everyone who was staying here live watching this. I hope it was useful. I hope you enjoyed learning about Redshift lights, the different camera settings. Sorry, we rushed through some of the stuff and sorry, we didn't get around to post effects, but that is, that's just like another little addition that we can, we can add on and we can learn about another time. We'll make sure we get around to those, um, around to that stuff. And yeah, get ready for next week and our final session. I still, I still can't believe that 
we're we're getting to the end of it next week. I'm gonna be it's gonna be sad when it's all over. Wow, right? But also thanks to Dr. Sassy too. It. Another another shout out <laughs> thanks to Dr. Sassy for going through all this yes. stuff. Shout sassy for those timestamps. They are really invaluable. And so, yeah, if you want to catch this up, this should be on the Max on Train Team YouTube channel by tomorrow morning. Uh, we'll make sure that's on there so you can catch up. And for anyone who has emailed about their trial, I absolutely will get on that over the next two days. So don't worry, it'll be there, ready for you to follow along with um, next week's session. Okay, so well, thanks again, everyone. Thanks again to Chad. Uh, I hope you guys enjoyed it. And um, have a lovely rest of your week. And I'll see you guys on next week's session or the or any other session. We've got Ask the Trader tomorrow. I'll be there. So <laughs> if you fancy that, I'll probably see you guys there as well. And yeah, have a good rest of your week too, Chad. Good Thank you too, Ellie. This was amazing. Thank you so much for all your preparation and all that you're sharing with us. It's absolutely incredible. Oh, my all pleasure. Right. I enjoy it. It's so much fun. <laughs> Cool, sweet. Right, well, have a good one, everyone, and I will catch you on the next one. Take care, everybody. See you, Ellie. Bye.